Good morning and thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the second in a series of webinars focused on restarting your future following the COVID pandemic. My name is Anthony Monaghan, Marsh's Manufacturing and Automotive Industry Sector Leader, and it's my pleasure to host you today. Our first webinar during COVID-19 pandemic, Restarting Your Future, focused specifically on workforce. And this second webinar is focused on the restart and steps you can take to maximize your recovery. Today's topics will include protecting employees, immediate actions and ensuring legal compliance in the return to work, profiling risks in current risk registers to account for changing demand, supply risks and your operating models as you restart, improving supply chain resilience and synchronizing logistic support to mitigate future supply risks, and finally, product related exposures and considerations. Introducing our panelists, we have three great speakers today to cover what are complex subjects. Darren Holmes, Head of Operational Risk Consulting at Marsh. David Stark, Consulting Director and Practice Leader of Enterprise Risk Services at Marsh. Tim Nash, Head of Product Recall Crisis Management at Bowering Marsh. And Nicola O'Neill, Senior Managing Consultant from our Crisis Management Team, who will be joining us for the Q&A. The webinar is scheduled to last 60 minutes. Panelists aim to conclude their overviews within 45, leaving us 15 minutes for some Q&A. I want to encourage you to submit any questions you have through the WebEx portal. Questions will be covered towards the end of today's session. You can type your questions into the bottom window on the bottom of your computer screen. Thank you for those who've submitted questions earlier in the week. We will aim to answer as many as we can. If we can't get back to your question today, we will come back to you soon with an answer. And during Q&A, we'll be running a poll for you to choose which topics you'll be interested in for future webinars. So, moving swiftly on, let's move to our first topic led by Darren Holmes. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for uh, joining our, our, our webinar today. Um, I really wanted to just start off by talking about some of the, the key things that we've found um, during uh, the lockdown and through the pandemic and, and particularly what we're hearing about um, from both clients and, and from regulatory authorities and from insurers as well. So if we can just jump onto the next slide please Rob. So Probably two of the uh, key um, areas and two key issues that have really jumped out as we look to return back to work, and I appreciate that some of you in the manufacturing sector will have continued to work through this. And I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about that as we as we move forward. Um, but the real two key areas that um, are probably taking up most of people's time at the moment is ensuring legal requirements under the Health and Safety at Work Act are maintained. Um, and we've seen a lot of talk, uh, a lot of uh, feedback from the enforcing authorities. And interestingly, at the beginning of lockdown, we saw the government sort of really sort of setting out the structure, minimum standards that we needed to follow. But I think that as we've started to come out of that lockdown, powers have now shifted back to the HSE um, to ensure that health and safety requirements are being fulfilled. I think it's also really important to note that the HSE have not changed their position all the way through lockdown or through the pandemic, in that the duty to ensure the health, safety and welfare of employees still remains the responsibility of the employer. I mean, I've got a little bit of data that I can share with you on that. The other key point that's really come out is, is about managing the, the, the potential from alleged claims and there's been, again, there's been quite a lot of information available on the internet um, in terms of what they think the position will be um, regarding COVID claims moving forward. Um, and some interesting points that have really come forward for me to sort of think about is talking to some of the insurance markets, perhaps the concerns aren't so much COVID-19 uh, claims where people are alleging that they contracted COVID-19 within the workplace, but rather as we get people into the workplace, what, what you know, are we exacerbating pre-existing conditions? And I'll, I'll talk about those in a little bit um, more detail as we move forward. If we can just jump onto the next slide, please, Rob. 
So some key areas um, from, uh, that I just wanted to touch on. Um, so the HSC um, will be ensuring that duty holds are complying with their obligations. They made that quite clear at the beginning. And I think we've seen a shift where government uh, placed responsibility for enforcing things like social distancing in public spaces with the police, for example, those powers have now been removed. But it's certainly appropriate that the HSC and the Environmental Health Officer, whoever your enforcing authority is, um, enforces those requirements moving forward with regards to health and safety legislation and this is very much about protecting workers and other people contractors for example I think are, are, are something that often sort of slip through the net just uh, just interestingly just before I sort of came onto this webinar I was doing a little bit of a search on on the HSE's web night, website um, around manufacturing sites and it's interesting to see that during the start of lockdown we saw about 80 um, that's eight zero improvement notices issued by the regulator. Now, I think it's fair to say that some of that process would have started to hear that in um, has started that process in the beginning. So they may have been investigated pre lockdown and pre pandemic, um, and they've only just now filtered through to the date of issue. But I do think that there's an important point around the the role of the HSE, HSE and that and this moving forward. So they've now so they have said that they will now continue with their inspection regime um, and have started up maintaining social distancing, of course, but they will also investigate deaths relating to COVID-19. Again, I think there's been a little bit of um, vagueness around what that actually means in practice. Um, particularly what they're talking about is COVID specific. So somebody working in a laboratory that's working with the COVID virus and they, and, and they smash the vial and then contract the virus and then die because of it. So I think it's important just to keep this in perspective. And I certainly would um, encourage people just to go back and look at the Health and Safety Executive's website and their guidance around it. There are some other areas which do create some grayness. So I think it's important to try and keep ahead of the curve in terms of what the messaging is. It is changing on quite a regular basis. So I've said that the HSC have issued around 80 um, enforcement notices um, during the period of lockdown um, and they have said that they will consider criminal prosecutions. I think we need to think about where they will be looking moving forward. Interesting investigating and looking a little bit deeper into what those improvement notices were served for. It would seem that they are very, um, very specific to do with things like working at high, manual handling, control of substances, hazardous to health. And certainly for the ones that I looked at, nothing was specifically COVID related. But I do think that that raises an issue. As we're trying to focus on getting people back to work, are we maintaining one eye on those mandatory requirements that are set out by the Health and Safety at Work Act? So how, you know, where we're updating things like risk assessments, for example, or control of substances hazardous to health risk assessments, are we still thinking about actually the daily operations that we undertake and are we fulfilling our legal obligations to ensure compliance? So I've said that the HSE has already issued improvement notices to a number of businesses since the start of, of the pandemic. I do think that we are seeing an increase in activity. I think we will continue to see that. I think also thinking wider around the, around the risk assessment and the impact of COVID-19 and return to work is having on your business. So considering those in your risk assessment, we do think that the HSC and the Environmental Health Officer will start to look at things like social distancing and how that's being maintained in the workplace. I, my view is that I, I think that that would be more around perhaps the hospitality, retail and leisure sector rather than the manufacturing sector. But that's not to say that the manufacturing sector is immune to that. And I think that, you know, if you do have, you know, if you have got an HSE visit coming up, then I do think that's something that, um, that would be worthwhile considering moving forward. If I can just jump onto the next slide, please, Rob. Um, so some areas to consider then for um, ac across activities, um, social distancing measures, again, continue to be something quite challenging. Um, I think that particularly in the manufacturing sector, we've seen some great guidance that's actually come out about how to maintain that. Thinking about things like shutting down um, canteens and rest areas. I would, I, I would probably offer a word of caution around that. There is a requirement within the regulations to actually ensure that you provide a place for people to rest. So I think it becomes quite challenging about how do I achieve one thing without 
um, breaching my my statutory obligations in another. Um, I think this has come quite clear around things like employment law, for example, where there is a, a, a challenge between bringing vulnerable or people coming back to work who may be defined as vulnerable, but then not discriminating the, against them. And I think that that rolls across into health and safety as well in terms of social distancing and, like I've said, the the, the rest areas. So looking at alternative areas, it might be um, it might be uh, meeting rooms, for example, and turning them into temporary rest areas and encouraging people to bring their own lunch, etc. Et Lots of different things that you can do, and there's some really great um, guidance available, and, and we can share some with you as well. Revision of risk assessments and safe systems of work. I'll come on to the civil liability side of it in a second. Um, but I think one that is constantly coming up, and the one that we're hearing most around, is about effective internal communications. I think it's really good practice to set up a communications team within the business with a COVID-19 related return to work focus, making sure that all information is filtered through one channel and then fed out and through, to, through the business um, to ensure that the messaging is consistent. I think one of the things that causes some concern, and again, this is particularly for the insurers, is that um, inconsistency in communication on what the procedures should be. Hygiene and cleaning practices obviously go um, go without saying, but again, making sure that you're uh, that you're keeping ahead of that. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about make, making sure that you're monitoring and keeping records of this as we go forward. We've seen a lot of talk about personal protective equipment. I think it needs to be suitable and adequate, bearing in mind that the health and safety um, requirements are that personal protective equipment should be used as a last resource. And I think that this is, tends to be quite relevant. There was some, um, some reference made by government about the use particularly of face masks within the workplace. Um, and again, I think it's just about reviewing the risk assessment and making sure that you're using personal prote protective equipment where it's appropriate, but looking at alternative methods of control before you have to go down to personal protective equipment. So increasing cleaning uh, regimes, for example, using Perspex screens, etc. Health surveillance has hit the spotlight um, quite recently, particularly from an uh, operational risk perspective and around the value of health health surveillance. Um, it's raised some concerns around the adequacy of it and also about the competency of being able to evaluate the data that comes out of it. I think again it creates some other concern around data protection. You know, if you are taking, uh, if you are doing health surveillance then it does become um, data under GDPR. So thinking about how you manage that and maintain that moving forward. Um, I'm not going to go through every single one. The one that I did just want to highlight was around utilities management. Um, we have seen an increase or peak in a number of claims, uh, not necessarily within the UK, but certainly within the US, where businesses in manufacturing have returned to work, turned some large plant machinery on, and, and, it's, actually, and it's had a critical failure, um, resulting in some quite large losses. Um, so I think that just making sure that equipment is ramped up carefully and that all the pre-inspections are done, etc., um, but and monitoring that closely as you start to ramp up manufacturing operations moving forward. So some practical considerations. Review the risk assessment process considering return to work and COVID-19. Think about training and coordination and making sure that you're recording that training in particular. Yes, you need to provide information, instruction and supervision, but actually recording training is also critical, particularly from a defensibility point of view. Reporting and monitoring, absolutely crucial with regards to claims defensibility, but also in evidencing that you've discharged your duty of care and implementing and maintaining social distancing, which I do think is going to be a challenge moving forward. Thinking about employee health and well-being, we've seen a 40% increase in um, concerns around anxiety in the, in the run-up to return to work. So I think certainly linking in with HR department would be, would be um, absolutely vital in making sure that that bit is managing. And as I've mentioned, reopening and start-up. If we can just jump to the next slide, please, Rob. So I just wanted to touch on some of the insurance perspective. Um, we've uh, worked closely with insurance risk engineers move, um, over the past 12 weeks. Um, some areas of concern that have really jumped forward are around stress and anxiety, and I've already mentioned that previously. 
musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal disorders also a concern, particularly where you are um, have less people coming into the workforce. So people may be doing things like routine tasks, repetitive tasks longer and might not be able to rotate throughout the work environment, thus increasing the risk of um, work-related upper limb disorders um, and sort of repetitive strain related issues as well. But also thinking about, you know, lifting and handling where they were two person tasks before, do they now need to become single person tasks? So making sure that manual handling risk assessments are up to date and adequate training has been provided and and this really sort of leads into my third point around incidents caused due to a reduction in resources so consideration given to workers who may, may be working alone and um, due to staff shortage shortages so some actions um, really about maintaining records I think that this is absolutely vital I think it's vital from a regulatory point of view in being able to demonstrate that you've discharged your duty of care but also from a civil liability perspective and ensuring particularly where claims may come in through um, alleged for employers liability or public liability in certain some circumstances that you've got the right evidence in place to be able to to prove it and I certainly would suggest some some monitoring around social distancing um, for those of you who have things like CCTV, I think it's very, um, very appropriate, but it might be that particularly in the manufacturing environment, that that's not, that's not prominent. So thinking about other ways that you can maintain that, that might just be through observation and recording through daily inspection checks, for example. Using risk assessment methodology to make informed decisions um, and, and documenting them and implementing inspection and monitoring procedures, as I've said, and maintaining physical records. And again, I think that that's very important moving forward, particularly as we may see some claims come further on down the line where there may be some lag in the report of those alleged claims that then take time to filter through. So they're the really sort of key points that I just wanted to touch on. Um, I'm actually now going to uh, hand you my 15 minutes is up. So I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, David Stark. Um, David, over to you. Thanks very much, Darren. Um, so hi, everyone. What I wanted to do is just give a few perspectives from the enterprise risk management area. So first slide for me, please, Rob. Um, yeah, I wanted to kick off with just setting the context, really. So. COVID-19 is obviously, it's a clear example of a societal risk, which has impacted us all far greater than we first envisage. So many people, when we first heard about the news of the outbreak in China in January, uh, whilst everyone was obviously very concerned for local people in China, uh, the first thing we thought about really was the, uh, the direct impact to supply chains back at home. Um, so obviously we know that manufacturing supply chains are hugely interconnected. So our risk perception, let's say, was informed by the previous pandemics of SARS and MERS, for instance, which had largely been contained uh, by the authorities uh, in the Far East and the Middle East. Um, and as for COVID-19, people fell into what's often referred to as heuristic judgment traps of data availability, representativeness, um, and it's based upon our own experiences or information which is provided to us. So to a degree, there was a bit of blinkering there. Um, now I'd classify COVID-19 as a grey swan event. Um, and it's uh, because just generally it's, it's a known risk. It has been a known risk, known societal risk, um, but its significance was assumed to be much lower than we've actually experienced. Um, many of you will be familiar with black swans. You may not have heard of uh, grey swans, but black swans, it was uh, a term described by uh, Nassim Tlaib in his book uh, called Black Swans. And they differ from grey swans in that there's no precedent for black swans. But with hindsight and with retrospect, post-rationalisation, it seems to be an event of critical concern. So people post-rationalise it. Now, COVID-19 isn't black, it's grey, because that risk has been on the radars of government, intergovernment agencies, such as the World Health Organization, um, uh, uh, because we've experienced those previous pandemics. So I often use the matrix, which I've got on the screen there, to help navigate the world of emerging risks. And I think this is one area that as risk professionals, um, we're all going to be doing more of. You'll see that I've broken it down into four quadrants. So moving around um, the diagram, from the top left, uh, we have events which are generally slow moving, 
um, but they're macro level themes such as geopolitical events. And then the top right quadrant uh, classifies events that um, may see changes in consumer behavior, perhaps consumer demand. Uh, maybe one example could be the rise of ethical food standards, uh, which impacts an industry or a smallish number of companies. The bottom right then uh, looks at the impacts at a more micro level again, um, but its effects are felt much quicker. So for instance, a large corporate governance failures, and there's been a few notable ones that we've had over the last few years, a couple obviously in manufacturing. Um, and then um, at the bottom left quadrant, we're classifying COVID-19 here, um, because obviously it falls into the macro level and its effect has been felt very quickly. Um, so while some other emerging risks may have already begun to materialize, such as climate change, and we spoke a lot about climate change um, earlier in the year prior to COVID-19, others may not actually crystallize at all. So there's a good, a good degree of uncertainty there. Um, some risks can swell rapidly to produce you know, near-term near shocks that you would feel in your own company or industry, industry subsector, I should say. Um, and they may uh, even just erode revenues over a steady basis, so that long sort of tail. Um, they may appear in a non-linear manner, um, and they may be characterized by responding to tipping points, a bit like what we've seen with COVID-19. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to set the context for that before I move on to industry insights. So my next slide, if you can, Rob, starts to talk about some of the observations for manufacturing sector. Um, clearly, the impact of COVID-19, it's had unprecedented impacts to, to everyone in the sector um, and their supply chain partners. I've already spoken about the interconnectivity of supply chain partners. Um, and as the sector's always known, uh, the highly interconnected, efficient, lean characteristics that many of you have in your organisations in the manufacturing sector are often seen as your strength and really good things. But in times of a crisis, there can be some weakness in there. So perhaps there's less slack in the system, there's less agility in the system because we are lean, because we are just in time, for instance. So one to think about, one that you may already be pondering. Now we saw that um, in 2011, we've seen it a few times, but it was in my mind, 2011, with the Far East NAPCAT events that we had and the Fukushima um, nuclear disaster. And many of us in the sector were talking about the implications to manufacturing and supply chains then. And with COVID-19, obviously that was the first thing in our minds uh, with the China dependencies, um, obviously the workshop of the world, uh, so to speak. So that was the first thing we st started talking about in January onwards. But since then, it's come much closer to home and we've had direct impacts to uh, key premises, key manufacturing sites and the health, safety, security, availability as well of members of staff, as Darren's alluded to. And there's been knock on catastrophic consequences, let's be honest, with a severe economic downturn that we're looking at. And obviously media reports today um, are suggesting that UK might be hardest hit by European neighbours. So at the bottom of the slide there, I'm showing my diagram, which tries to pull out some of the key factors. So uh, starting from the left, obviously financing uh, has been particularly hard hit. Customer demand, the supply of materials, goods and services, um, and obviously reduce productivity. Productivity is key. You guys and your colleagues in your businesses are experts at making sure maximizing productivity, but it's been hit, social distancing. Um, so even for, for companies who've um, uh, kept a degree of operations going through the crisis, there's been productivity implications. So with all this huge volatility and pivots in supply chain and demand factors, and the associated changes to strategy, operations, finance, and risk and assurance, we're seeing the increasing need for integrated risk management. And it's going to be led by many of you guys on this call. And, you know, uh, it could be supported by um, colleagues such as Darren, myself, Tim, and others, Nicola on the call as well, working in an integrated manner with you. So we refer to our collaborative approach, working with uh, 
uh, clients and, and colleagues as the crisis recovery solution. And it's really, I suppose, the call to arms for us as, uh, as collective risk professionals, you and us. So on the next slide, I just want to talk about a few of the key questions that we feel from an enterprise perspective um, that leaders in your businesses would start to, to be talking about. And, and Will, no doubt, have already spoken to you about a few of these things. So um, let's start from the, uh, go from left to right. So if we start with the Chief Executive Officer, uh, they're obviously asking important questions about strategy. Um, Chief Finance Officer, obviously concerned about the risk factors and the impact on the financial success of the business. The Chief Operations Officers, focused on obviously the assets, the efficiency, safety, supply chain. And then the Chief Human Resources Officer is obviously thinking about the people agenda, maybe the return to work, but safety, um, uh, mental health and well-being, matters such as that. So you'll have noticed, I haven't called out the questions, but I'm sure you're, you're just reading as I'm talking. Quite a lot of them are risk-related questions. So it needs to have ownership and uh, participation from you guys as risk managers and risk leaders in your business on that, on the analysis, the planning, the management and the governance of risks. And many of you will be involved, will, will probably have been on previous sessions that uh, myself, Darren and others have had on the changing role of the risk manager. It's been a theme we've spoken about a few times now. And some of you may well uh, be well along that journey. Others, you may have only just started. And in my opinion, that's one of the most significant changes that we're going to see going forward. I see that need for um, increasing the remit of the risk manager and to be broader, more strategic, constructively challenging uh, your own colleagues in the right way, of course, and part of that cross-departmental conversation to determine that threats, opportunities are prioritised, they're accurately assessed uh, in terms of the impacts to the business. And then fundamentally, you design, you manage, you test the effectiveness of control strategies. And insurance is obviously one of the key ones. Um, and it's all within the contracts of your enterprise risk appetite, the risks that you're willing to take. OK, so, Rob, if you would, the next slide, please. So it's really important that risk analysis, management and governance is integrated into the organization's value chain. It shouldn't just be a tick box exercise. It's gotta be integrated. Uh, and it, it can't just be a red tape bureaucratic exercise. So sure, it needs to be independent. There needs to be some level of assurance and guidance from the risk function. And I always think the starting point has to be a really good deep understanding of your organization's value chains. The key activities um, that are in place uh, the connection with the organisational objectives and ultimately stakeholder value and how you achieve stakeholder value in your own firm. It's going to be different from your competitors. So the value chain on the slide, it, it is generic, but you'll recognise quite a lot of the categories there um, uh, which relate to your company, I'm sure. Uh, and it reflects some of the risk issues that we feel are pertinent with COVID-19. So I just want to pick out a few of them. Um, under production to the top right, the third bullet point lists changing customer demands. And I appreciate that many of your competitors have taken, uh, uh, sorry, many of your companies, many of you guys on the call, you've undertaken fantastic work during this crisis. It's really been a, a, an excellent call to arms to help out our key workers, our health workers, it may be producing machines such as ventilators, it may be on provision of uh, personal protective equipment, but it's a really good initiative from the manufacturing sector on that. So I wanted to acknowledge that. But I think, you know, when it gets back to steady state in the longer term, you're going to revert back to your more conventional products. Um, and you'd already be seeing the demand side projections rapidly changing. Um, there's, there may even be a need to diversify to some other products or export to other countries. And, you know, with that in mind, dare I say it, it raises that horny subject or sleeping tiger of Brexit. You know, it's been in the news again today. Brexit planning is firmly needs to be on the agenda. There's a lot to talk about from the risk perspective. So moving around the diagram a bit more, technology. Well, it's been widely reported, as you probably know, that cyber risk is on the rise. So sadly, there are criminals out there who uh, are seeking to 
uh, exploit some of our uh, dependencies that obviously we're all having on uh, information technology, but also you guys obviously in manufacturing have operational technology, um, which ensures the efficient, uh, productive um, um, uh, sort of processes within your organization. So it's important to reinvestigate what the cyber threats are, what the vulnerabilities are, how good the controls are, and also where insurance comes into that as well, as always. So on the, the top left, just to call out another one, I just wanted to flag again the obvious one of supply chain, which has had considerable upheaval. So there's inevitably going to be changes on your supply chain relationships going forward in the interdependencies. Um, as you know, it's critical to have a really well-informed risk-based assessment, strong controls and insurance in place for that component, which is critical um, for you guys in manufacturing. Um, product recall is obviously really critical as well. And a shout out to Tim, who's coming up after me, uh, that Tim's going to be talking that in more detail. Um, my next slide I want to take you through, and if you can, Rob, thank you very much, is around our crisis recovery solution. Um, so this slide summarises our approach. Uh, it starts at the top left with workforce impacts and return to work forecasting. And we've been working with quite a few um, organisations, international organisations, through the crisis to help advise on the epidemiological trends of the virus and the implications to their global workforce. Um, it's going to continue to resonate, to be perfectly honest, as we think about the resurgence, the, the possible second wave. We know that with R, the way it is in the UK and in European countries as well, we could have a resurgence on the business. There needs to be some agility, there needs to be some forecasting on what the implications are to the value chain. The middle jigsaw piece looks at the return to work plan development. Now, Darren's taken you through quite a few and, and many of the really pertinent points on that. So I don't want to dwell on that. Just want to show how connected it is there. And then the top right piece of the jigsaw then looks at business restoration plan development. So focusing on the new risk realities of your business um, and your industry subsector in honesty. So analyzing the risks, looking at the controls, looking at the resilience strategy, implementing risk management initiatives, um, and making sure they have the maximum benefit to your business. So focusing on, focusing on the things that really matter. Now underpinning all of that is the business impact forecasting, uh, which models the key risk scenarios in your business, the economic drivers to integrate with financial planning and determine operational and financial impacts to key financial metrics. And they include obviously profit and loss, balance sheet strength, cash flow. Um, I think, you know, in the dark days, uh, risk has been quite siloed. Going forward, it shouldn't be. It needs to integrate in. And this one, that, that pillar is all about integrating in with strategic planning, financial planning uh, to do something about it. So my next slide then, just very briefly, because conscious of time, just talks a little more about the activities under each of those crisis recovery components. I'm not going to list the slide. I think you'll get the slide pack afterwards. Just to pull out a few things though. So obviously social distancing, resurgence, uh, 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 virus, the, the need for that agility, you know, comes into play with that workforce impact and return to work forecasting. Um, action planning, return to work measures, claims defensibility, potential liabilities, so let's say all the things that Darren's articulated, they're the return to work plan development. And obviously business restoration plan development looks at risk analysis, appetite controls, governance, supply chain, the post analysis, the lessons learned on how well your resilience strategies work, how well your risk management strategy has worked. And underpinning it all, we have that business impact forecasting that integrates risk and financial analysis with strategic planning and insurance transfer. So those are the key things that I wanted to say from the enterprise risk perspective. I want to now please hand over to Tim, who's going to take you through all product recall considerations. Thank you very much, David. Good morning, everyone. And thank you again for joining today's webinar. Uh, so I'm Tim Nash, I head up the product recall team here at Marsh. We sit within the wider crisis management division. My day to day really involves providing product recall risk transfer solutions to a number of businesses throughout the supply chain. 
So first of all, I wanted to say, look, we respect the fact that a number of businesses have worked through the current pandemic, whereas obviously there are a number of other businesses that have paused production and are now going through that phased return. For my section of today's webinar, I'm going to outline some key considerations which could impact product integrity from three different perspectives. Firstly, the product recall insurers, and then the recall insurers retain consultants, and then I was going to cover a few of our broker considerations. So if we move on to the next slide and talk about some of the insurers' considerations. We asked insurers three questions. Those questions were, what new exposures do you foresee in the new normal? What new considerations will you expect to see from clients? And will you review risks differently in the new normal? And if so, how? So if we look into that first question, what new exposures do you foresee in the new normal? Here are a few of the responses. Underwriters thought that there'd be less recalls in 2020 as regulators concentrate on just keeping supply chains moving. They thought there'd be more recalls in 2021 as regulators pivot back to protecting consumers from, say, from a safety standpoint. They thought there'd be more issues caused by companies come out, coming out of mothballing plants and making, uh, a quote, bracket, uh, mistakes. They thought there'd be a big rush to get products to the market, to stay ahead of competition, especially given people's change in habits. They seem to think that more people will want to be using private vehicles and avoiding public transport. And also with those sorts of shifts and trends that actually companies will be bringing their product to market. And as a result, the R&D on some of those products might not be as comprehensive as before the pandemic. They had concerns around the need to ensure enough qualified staff are available to operate and maintain production machinery 24 seven. In their mind, Increased quality issues leads to increased failures, which ultimately could result in more recalls. And the availability of staff who have been furloughed and who might have moved on to other jobs may compound the issue as companies seek to step up production and rehire. And the final point that they made on this first question is during a, during a recession, we would expect to see a slight drop off in quality standards and some companies cut back on maintenance programs of product production machinery. So you might see a double whammy of lack of qualified staff and a reduction in the maintenance programs. So moving on to that second question now, what new considerations would you expect to see from clients? Insurers would like to see what clients' plans are. They want to see that there's a plan and a strategy in place rather than just opening up some of these facilities and crossing their fingers. There'll be a much greater focus on managing supply chain and the product quality and insurers will want to see workplace risk assessments for staff working on the ongoing COVID pandemic. And then finally, moving on to that third question, will you review risks differently in the new normal? And here are just a few of the responses to that one. Insurers will be more focused on the quality of information they receive and more insistent on seeking missing information at the moment, sometimes we might be able to get insurers to make a concession on some outstanding information, but I think given everything going on, they're really going to be pushing to make sure that their underwriting files are, are complete and actually make sure that they get that outstanding information. There will be a proliferation of new proposal forms developed which go into more specific product details. At the moment, we take quite a general approach and actually we can cover a number of different components from different industries under generic proposal forms. But I think the information requests are gonna get much more specific from insurers so they can really better understand the risk that they're underwriting. And the final point that they made, that the clients that can demonstrate and actively review and manage some of these issues, well, they are the ones who are gonna receive preferential terms. So that's the view of the insurers. So now let's move on to the next slide and look at the view of the consultants. These consultants are on hand 24 seven to help in the event of a recall and the utilize and, and the insurers utilize them. So the uh, clients can access resources that they might not have internally. They're the ones currently in the field supporting businesses like yours. So they're well placed to provide us with some thoughts on what they can see at the moment. 
The first consideration that they had was staff. Now, I'm not going to go into that in much detail because obviously Darren did pick up on that earlier in the webinar and we have run other sessions to that being the sole focus. So if we move on to the second point there, supply chain risks. Manufacturing businesses have concerns about how to approve new suppliers to meet changing demands or shortfalls from existing suppliers. Many on-site certification audits aren't happening across multiple industries. There's been much talk about food fraud due to the pandemic, and there's a heightened concern around the risk of counterfeiting of components in the manufacturing sector. Where supply chains are strained and there is a margin to be made, criminals will produce counterfeit products. Moving on to that third point, training. Lack of staff training is always a risk as it can lead directly to production errors. Unfortunately, staff training is often one of the first areas to be cut when time and budgets are tight. But from our experience and the consultant's experience, the impacts of this might not be seen until much later down the line. The day-to-day -day quality assurance. What they seem to be finding is that there's a lot of effort and time being put into the impact of the current pandemic. And there are concerns that there's not enough time being put into the usual day-to-day -day quality assurance and risk management of some operations. So what are some of the solutions to this? Well, a number of manufacturers are now utilizing remote audits along with remote training, and obviously sessions like these and, and hopefully providing some thoughts and actually being taken away and, and applied into the business. But some of this can actually be paid for by the recall insurers, if not subsidized by the insurers as well. Because often when clients go for a risk transfer solution in the product recall space, there's a bursary that helps with mitigating these sorts of exposures. So that's definitely something that we need to be obviously pushing a little bit more and making sure people are aware of. So finally, if we move on to the next slide, we just wanted to give you a few of our thoughts and a few things that we would be considering in the conversations that we're having with a number of different manufacturing clients. Now, these are questions and, and some comments that are obviously just there to use as a bit of a platform and a building block and actually just to challenge you and, and to get a conversation going. So first of all, that top one, position in the supply chain. Think about whether you've changed your position in the supply chain. You might not even be making a product, but you might have offered up storage space or transportation services as part of the offer coronavirus support for, from your business. Think about the impact of a defect or a fault could have on some of the products in your care. Would you be liable for any fault whilst handling a product and not doing anything else to it? Was your brand relatively unknown with historical business to business trading? Will you now be more visible to customers and your brand may be more visible to customers? What can you be doing to protect that brand? What happens if one of your suppliers provides you with a faulty component or part? Will they have the funds to make you good in light of the current situation with a strained balance sheet? Or will your balance sheet have to retain the cost of a recall because the suppliers couldn't? Moving on to the second point, entering new industry segments and markets. Have you had to show a degree of agility and move into a new industry or market, whether that be PPE, sanitizers, screens, or the alike? Have you been repurposing production lines to meet those needs? And is the product ultimately fit for purpose? What could the implication be if there are defects with the products that you've currently been supplying in that new industry segment? Moving on to that third point, working at increased capacity to meet customer demand. Are you currently in the position of hyper-growth hyper and ramping up production and running near 100% capacity? What would the impact of having to recall a product now have on the business? With the increased sales, could there be more significant business interruption loss? Do you truly understand your first and third party exposure? What are the values of your largest contracts? How much of your annual revenue does this make up? How reliant are you on that contract? Or have you got a number of contracts or just rely on the one there? Moving on to utilizing alternative suppliers. In order to get the products you need, have you been able to maintain the same level of auditing? According to the consultants, this hasn't been the case. 
Have you needed to move supplier and now subject to more onerous contractual conditions in the event of a product defect or receiving faulty products from a customer, from a supplier? Over the next 12 months and onwards, will we see plans to bring back manufacturing segments to the UK in order to build up a level of resilience? And should there be a shift in focus when onboarding some of these new suppliers that we're having to utilise? And then the, the fifth point now, what to do in the event of a recall? This week we've seen a government mandated recall of hand sanitizer in Canada due to the product being made with industrial grade ethanol. So can we expect to see similar issues over here in the UK? Given these uncertain times, make sure the crisis management plan has been updated to reflect the limited resources available to you, whether it be space or personnel. If you have to bring back product into a facility, is this going to disrupt the plans that you've put in place to protect your employees? Where is the product going to go? Who's going to handle these products whilst running a skeleton operation? Even if it is business as usual, or as close as it can be, there'll need to be changes made to your recall plans. Who will be called up to assist with a recall if a key person is off with COVID-19? These have just been a few thoughts, and I'd be more than willing to go into more detail on an individual call to expand on any of the points raised and a potential risk transfer solution. Hopefully it's clear that with, every, with taking every precaution, there are new exposures businesses face in, in respect of product integrity. There have been a number of themes which all three parties can agree will be focal points going forward, including the quality of product, the availability and the appropriately trained staff, and the need to have a reliable supply chain. So thank you for your time, and I'll now pass over to Anthony for questions. Okay, thank you, Tim, uh, and thanks everyone for, for your speaking today. Uh, apologies to everyone for the um, quality of my uh, microphone to start. Hopefully you can hear me now. We have a colleague ready to take over, if not. Um, but that ends the main part of our presentation today, and uh, we'd like to turn to some questions. Uh, we've got a bit of time, so I'm hoping we'll get four questions in total. Um, we'll also run the poll for you now, so you can select which uh, of the itemised subjects would be of interest to you at a future um, webinar. So, uh, Darren, uh, first for you please, you've had a question um, around skin conditions, uh, so what do we think about uh, the future claims in this, in respect to skin conditions, given that um, there's, all, there's already been a few incidents of people having to uh, seek treatment for hand gel related issues? Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, um, Anthony. And um, just regarding that, I, I think the first port of call I would suggest that you uh, go to um, is occupational health um, and get what you're after there is the opinion of a medical professional to advise on what action needs to be taken, which is which is quite a, a, a strong argument um, because it will be then recorded. Probably, I'm not saying it is, I'm not no medical uh, professional, but I would imagine that the issue is to do with the high alcohol content, which is actually stripping the skin of oils, causing the skin to dry out. Now, normally in, in, in sort of normal times, you would use a barrier cream to be able to protect the skin from doing that. But the problem with using a barrier cream is it has a detrimental effect to the use of and the purpose of a hand sanitizer. So um, again, go back to your risk assessment process. Think about your controls for the spread of infection. So that typically will sit under your control of substances hazardous to health regulations risk assessment. As a control, the use of hand sanitizer, you then need to look at the assessment of that and the suitability of that within your workforce and use the advice and guidance of your occupational health or your company doctor, if you have one, where that can't be provided. There are other solutions, which would be increased use of gloves, but again, be very careful with gloves. For example, latex gloves, for example, um, are, are known to, to cause additional skin conditions. So you might want to think about nitrile gloves, gloves, but use the advice of a medical profession to decide on what action you should take moving forward. Don't. Uh, David, um, what risk management lessons has the COVID-19 crisis taught us? Um, I, I go back to my point about emerging risks. So I think we all need to be 
um, better about thinking about the externalities and emerging risks and the vulnerabilities that they would have on the business. So with that goes, you need to really have a very good knowledge of the interdependencies between your different uh, production facilities, uh, between the functions in your facilities and with your supply chain as well. Um, knowing where the resilience is, knowing where the control uh, weaknesses are and what to do about it so that responsiveness can really kick in as much as possible. Uh, and then, you know, it touches on uh, many of the operational factors that Darren said about really robust risk assessments, very good communication, crisis communication, um, and visibility, visible leadership um, from the seniors in your organisations and the way that risk can help with that interconnectivity um, between parties. So bringing together the conversation, um, because in my opinion, there's a lot of risk-based views that need to come to the, uh, to the fore. So those are the key things for me. So some of the basics there. Um, and I think, you know, think about the way that you look at risk going forward. The, the analogy I often use is if we're in a car, you know, we need to be looking out the windscreen, not looking out the rear view mirror. And sometimes, in honesty, in risk world, it feels like we're looking in the rear view mirror. What happened, not what will happen. And we need to be a bit more proactive, all of us in that regard. So key risk indicators, risk dashboards, risk solutions, the integration of risk between different practices, whether it's strategic, operational, financial, regulatory type risks. Uh, and the role of insurance as well. So just a few thoughts there, Anthony. Lovely, thank you, sir. Uh, Tim, um, what are insurers doing with the uncertainty of an annual forecast uh, when recall policies are due for renewal? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, we, we've had a number of different clients who've actually come back to us and, and given us a revised forecast just to make sure that the premiums being charged by the recall underwriters are actually appropriate. And, what we've been pushing the market to do is actually um, revert to a minimum deposit model. So whereby we actually just get them to agree to pay a percentage of the, the premium up front. And come the end of the policy period, we can make an actual adjustment and make sure that the premium being paid by our client base is more akin to the actual exposures over that policy period, as opposed to that annual forecast up front. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Nicola, um... Thanks for joining Q&A, and we have one for you too. Um, what, what should we be doing now to prepare for the potential resurgence or, or even the second wave of the pandemic? Hi, thanks, Anthony. Um, yeah, I guess over the last few months, we've seen um, all organisations mobilising their crisis response teams. Um, and, you know, even the most um, rehearsed, robust teams have probably had to restructure, refocus as the situation evolves. Um, and I guess there's a momentum to always move forward to the next phase, look at how we're going to deal with what's coming down the line. We would say, you know, it's really important maybe at this point in time to take a little bit of time to reflect on what has worked well for you in this situation, the things that you've introduced to really help your team communicate well, um, keep on track of what's happening, um, and to capture those lessons learned so that you can um, accelerate almost to let your capability to respond in the event that there is a second wave as, as there's a lot of talk about that in the winter months ahead. I guess the other thing that we would say is to really look at the resources available over the winter months um, because if you're in the middle of trying to ramp up and get into that real restoration phase of your business and you do hit the second wave then you want to simultaneously manage the response piece but not let the, the, you know, the sustained effort towards recovery be impacted by that. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, so thank you everyone, and I think we're, we're almost at time. Um, so glad that the, uh, the communication issues were just with me. I understand you managed to hear all of the speakers, which obviously is the, the key message for the day. Um, thank you all for taking time out of the daily round of conference calls and Zoom meetings, et cetera, to participate. Um, a huge thanks to our panelists again, Thank you for your insight and thoughts. Uh, Vanessa Thompson, thanks for working with us to get this, uh, to make this work. And Rob Northcote for making, uh, making us up on video and on Zoom. Uh, a copy of today's slides will be sent to everyone that registered and attended. Uh, and we have some additional material to send to you also, which we believe will be of interest. Uh, please 
don't hesitate to contact us, uh, speak to your normal Marsh representative for any questions or concerns you have, or whether you'd like to take some of the conversation further. Um, in general, for more information and resources, uh, you can look at our, um, our COVID-19 resource hub on marsh.com forward slash UK. Uh, here you'll find our current thought leadership offerings, solutions and advice. Um, you can stay up to date on the Marsh news by following Marsh Global on Twitter. Um, and um, other than that, uh, our best wishes to you. Thank you very much for joining again. Uh, take care and stay safe. Thank you.